see, it just doesn't feel right. Hi, this is episode 274 of the Fat Squirrel Speaks, and today is Friday, June 26th. I'm Amy Beth, also known as The Fat Squirrel on Ravelry, and The Vet SQRRL on Instagram. Hey. So yeah, I just can't do the hello for a minute. It just feels too bleh. I'll go back to hello. I promise. Like, some of you have asked, and it's just, there's just too much. It's too much right now. Um... And it feels disingenuous. So we're pairing it back even more this week. Like you're at the dining room table. You are with me at the dining room table. I can't lift up. I'm like, I'm going to show you that you're, uh, you're sitting at the quilt. There's the messy game shelf, which I did not dust or organize in any way. There's backlighting. I am unshowered and I'll, oh my gosh though, can we discuss? The milkmaid braids. Can we discuss how excited I am? Mm. Yes, this will be the rest of the summer. You're welcome. I'm now the fanciest. Gus is still crazy. Gus, you're not even. There has been a squirrel that's been tormenting him that keeps running along the roof lines between the house on either side of us and ours. And it's really trying to make him crazy. <laughs> I wish you could see how ridiculous he is. He is pretty ridiculous. So, <laughs> so administrative stuff. Next time, I will do prizes for folks who um, contribute to the podcast financially with real live human currency. I'll do that next time. Um, and I think that's the administrative, right? I don't have shop update planned. There will be one soon, um, but I am waiting for fabric to come in. It's, I'm really excited about it. Should I show you the sample? Okay, I'm gonna be right back. Okay, never mind. Apparently I purged the sample. I tell you what, there have been a couple of like, mental health wobbles that have um, resulted in ridiculously weird cleaning hiccups. I don't even know what to call them. Like the illogical ones that like my brain doesn't even, like I'm not expecting to clean the thing. And so then I'm cleaning the thing when it's like 95 degrees and I have seven other things that are going on at the same time. But for some reason, if I don't clean this one, I, as I said last time, I am not a housekeeper at all. Like none. Um, and sometimes it's not a house thing. Sometimes it's like a random, like obsession with like an outside thing that a project that needs to be done or, but it's just like the thing that you can control. And so you think you're doing, you know, understandably okay in the day. And then suddenly like, one too many things happens <laughs> and you find yourself like on your knees cleaning the equivalent of grout. I don't even have grout in my house. I do. I mean like tile grout, you know what I mean? Like I find myself on the floor cleaning something that's ridiculous. Anyway, and like nothing around it will be clean. Like nothing. there's no like, oh, that was satisfying and put my mind at ease. Perhaps I should clean the adjacent things. No, let's, <laughs> no, that's not pizza. Let's it's not pizza. Like, it does leave me in a place of like deep. It's not solidarity because they have experienced such a different thing than I am experiencing, but like deep empathy and deep like sisterhood with all of the women who have experienced menopause without the use of air conditioners. Like, can we just take a minute to hold those women? Like my grandmother would, claim, would can like 300 quarts of green beans in the summer without air conditioning or a dishwasher. There are still women out there working without air conditioning, going through menopause. And I, feel you every night at about 9 p.m. Because <laughs> not only 
am I on medication to help them so that I only have warm flashes? But like, I'm also a fat lady and fat cells produce estrogen, so I'm having a softer landing than a lot of y'all have. Let's hold them in our hearts, y'all. It's real. Real. Also, hence the milkmaid braids. I don't want my touch to me, touch me in any way. The other night, I actually unpinned the braids like an hour before I went to bed, but was like at right before my nine o'clock scheduled hot flash. And the, f the braids touching me murder would have been justifiable. What was that? So, yeah, did you just see? Uh, did you see me? I picked up the remote to stop this and be like, that is just ridiculous. But I'm not going to. I'm trying to be authentic with you. So sometimes it's ridiculous. There you go. Anyway. And I just sprayed iced coffee all over myself. And I'm going to use my dog's bandana to wipe it up. Welcome to my table. So this week's episode is going to have... It's going to have shenanigans of the mind... It's going to have shenanigans of the gullet. It's going to have spinning. It'll have a little bit of knitting. It'll have crochet and it'll have sewing at the end. Spoiler alert. I sewed pants. Three pairs for myself. And I'm really excited about it. FYI, you could probably put your vintage sheets on eBay now and charge a million dollars for them because I'm going to buy them all. Okay, so let's get into it. Shenanigans of the mind. So I do shenanigans of the mind sometimes when there are no real world shenanigans. We they kind of inter they are kind of this this time. Because Tova and I went after her dentist appointment, which is in like the fancy okay, by the way. Because of the pandemic. Uh, they were not letting, well, they would allow parents into the dentist's office, but they, they requested that you not go into the dentist's office if you didn't feel you needed to be there for your child. And my child is 13 and has been going to the same dentist for nine years. And they are, the, they're like way nicer than I am. So I was like, I felt, she felt confident. I felt confident that she could go in by herself. And it was really even though all of the people at her dentist office are exceedingly kind, um, it is in a fancy area of town. And I always feel like a country bumpkin when I roll up in there with my fat self. And so it was really nice not to have that. <laughs> but anyway, that was neither here nor there. Um, after that, we went to the, like, the local plant place that's up that way, which I had not been to. And... But Tova's kind of a little bit obsessed with houseplants at the time, at the moment. Whatever, I am terrible at houseplants and don't own any because I killed them all. Um, but so we went up there and, oh my gosh. I wanted to spend every dollar I have to my name. Actually, I wanted to spend dollars that I did not have to my name. That would be the better description of what I wanted to spend. I have not been a flower planter, a flower gardener. I only do like some vegetables. Um, and I really have generally just been like, flowers, what's the point of that? That's for fancy people. But now I feel like I might be in the flower planting camp. I'm definitely in the mental shenanigans camp of flower. Like I'm at least a hobby flower planter. I'm just thinking about it. I want to be in your fantasy flower planting league. Uh, Cause I got plans. So many plans. <laughs> so <laughs> We've really had bad luck trying to get stuff to grow in the front of the house. And like, really we don't, we don't actually 
go in and out of the front of the house very often, like our garage is in the back, our int main entrance to the house is in the back. Um, and it definitely looks pretty, you know, ramshackle is a nice word for it. And so there are people that have like purchased the house across the street and are doing it up really cute. And then the people next to them are like, oh, well, we're gonna just like COVID paint the exterior of our house. And then I'm all like, um, we need to at least get like a plant. <laughs> So we've, I have purchased some like really nice hydrangeas to put out there, but, and then I was like, but they've just not done anything for like three years. And so again, pointing to my issue that I'm like, I am just bad at flower gardening. The only like plants that have a flower that do well are the peonies that I literally don't touch. And like, yeah, they're doing really great. <laughs> but, um. And I've tried to plant other things too, like, and I'm just not good at it. But anyway, neither here nor there. So I decided like, okay, so we were at this place and I was not planning on buying any plants. Well, you know how that goes. I bought a black Kodiak honeysuckle because it says that it does well in shade. Because the hydrangeas, to my fault, like they do say partial shade. And I do think they get more than a partial shade out there. I think they almost get full shade. Um... And so I thought it was that, but actually after I dug up one of the hydrangeas to relocate it, I'm pretty sure it's actually because the soil is terrible. And I don't know why I didn't realize that when I planted that hydrangea last time. Like how did I not realize, maybe because my husband d dug that hole because it was like for Mother's Day or my birthday or something. <laughs> That's probably what it was. It's like all rock. Like I think what it is, is like we have a super tall front porch because we're on like a we're on a bit of a hill and in fact a couple of our neighbors to the north of us and one to the south of us have like actual retaining walls in front of their yards by the way i'm sweating so much so i hope i'm glowing for you um so i think that actually what's happening is like the soil has eroded like i think there was probably at one time some soil in there that was not terrible you know like 30 years ago but it's just eroded because of the steepness of that bank and that us not being able to grow anything in that place to like hold the soil down. So it's not been like drastic that I've noticed it. But as I was digging, I was like, it is like all brick chip and like gravel, which I'm thinking was probably like the drainage element that was added and then like topsoil was put on top of it at some other point. And I think the topsoil has just all eroded. That's a lot of me talking. Anyway, so I think it's I think the reason the hydrangeas are not doing as well is 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 mostly that, and then also that they're not getting a ton of sun. But so I decided that I'm gonna move that I moved one of the hydrangeas and then I planted my Kodiak black honeysuckle. But I also bought some ferns because hi, oh my gosh, one of them is a maidenhair fern and fern and I mean we're not gonna get married because I feel like she's too delicate for me. But, you know, something, a lot. I need to, de maybe I need to devote like a shrine to her or something. That's what I should do. Yeah. She's so beautiful. And um, so I, but I haven't planted those out there because I've realized like as I'm trying to dig this hole for this, to switch out the hydrangea and this other plant that like, I got to do something. I got to like build up a flower bed. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know if I use landscape timbers. I think that's probably what we're going to do. Because, yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> it's so, where was I going with this? Shenanigans of the mind. So then that morphed into, okay, so maybe the problem is just the, it's not just the soil, but it's primarily the soil. And so then, like, I'm going to build this up. Well, then for symmetry, I should probably build up. There's just, like, this very narrow strip on the other side of the house between, like, the sidewalk and the house. Or it's not the sidewalk because, but the path that leads from the front of the house to the back of the house. But there's only, like, 18 inches of soil there and like they just had wild mint growing there another thing that's done really well because I've literally not touched it it's doing great um <laughs> so so oh so then I was all like oh my gosh well sir symmetry we should build up that side just a little bit too and then I can put something in there and maybe we could get something that would grow up kind because of, that gets more like partial sun like it actually gets almost full day sun but 
there's houses and so it gets a little bit shaped whatever it's like maybe I could put something in there that kind of grow up and kind of not damage my brick but maybe hide how it needs to all be retucked <laughs> And in fact, how it was retucked by a sketchy dude who did not do a good job. So, so then that led me to climbing hydrangeas. Do you know about climbing hydrangeas? I didn't even know about climbing hydrangeas. They don't really destroy what they're growing on because they don't put in tendrils. They use like a sticky stuff, like like little frog hands that just stick on to the outside. So they can be very difficult to remove. But for example, you can have them grow up trees and they won't damage the tree. And apparently they're very slow to get started, but then eventually they'll take off and they'll grow like gangbusters. I don't know what the origin of that phrase is. Um, and I'm just excited about them. And then that led to, well, clearly we need to repaint our garage, which does need to be repainted. Um, well, I mean, need. There's no homeowners association here. No, no. But then that led to, oh my gosh, we need to have climbing hydrangeas everywhere because it's sort of like in a, like my English garden, except not. And then, but clearly to really better make the hydrangea pop, we should definitely paint the garage charcoal gray. My husband doesn't know this yet. I don't, I don't. <laughs> Luckily for me, like we've had some houses get flipped in this area and one of them is charcoal gray and it does look striking. Maybe it's not quite charcoal, but it's a darker gray. And then the house across from us that they would COVID are painting is like navy blue. So I'm like, I might get away with my charcoal gray garage. Right, I'm just looking at the robin. And I'm like, that robin's gonna look great against my charcoal gray garage. And then when you come over and you sit in the yard, you'll be like, whoa, this place is fancy. And I'll be like, yeah, it totally is. It'll still be bootleg. <laughs> okay, but that's enough of my uh, garden shenanigans of the mind of gardening. What else has been going on in my brain? Okay, so I'm reading, um, I'm still here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. And I've either listened, I must have listened to this book before, um, but not read the physical, or maybe I checked it out from the library. But um, I'm... I'm not talking about the book today, um, although it is quite good, but I wanted to tell you about, um, since we kind of talked a little bit last week, let me, by the way, say thank you for, so many of you had like very kind and very soft responses to um, my talking about the police abolition podcast that I had listened to. And really, I was overwhelmingly heartened by their responses. Um, I was expecting a lot of pushback and I'm sure that there were lots of people who had pushback who didn't respond and thank you. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say thank you for those responses. This week, well, this time, um, since I've been reading this book, I was, there's actually like a whole like that happened. Like for some reason I was recommended the podcast with um, Brene Brown that features Austin Channing Brown. Anyway, I listened to that. It was really great. I enjoyed it heartily, but in it, and I'd like to talk about it at a later date. Um, but in it, she talks about, or Austin Channing Brown talks about her show, um, which is the next question, the next question. And you can find it on her website. If you just Google Austin Channing Brown, you'll go to her website. You'll see the next question is there. Um, and there's, it's produced, it's available through Vimeo right now. And no charge. Um, and there's, I think, eight episodes or something like that. So I listened to the, ep or I watched, listened to the episode with Rachel Cargill. Um, and so, again, I would also like to talk about that episode because it was so good. Like, I cannot recommend it enough. And there's so much that I wanted to talk about about it. <laughs> 
not talk about about it, but like I just, I just feel like it deserve. It's so deserving of round table discussion. But anyway, it was, and it's 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 not just about her work, um, as a in racial justice. It's a it's she touches on so many things that just had so much resonance in terms of like body neutrality versus like body positivity and it's just it was really interesting that's the worst description of something ever but i don't want to talk about that today what i would like to talk about though is th through that i found that they also have an episode with ooh, maya shinwar sorry and she is a prison abolitionist specifically. And so I highly recommend it, especially if you found um, the interview about police abolition interesting. Like this is along the same line, um, but she specifically is a prison abolitionist. And I think the reason I'm finding these, well, for one thing, they're just nothing I have ever heard of before, right? Like I had, I didn't, I didn't even know that it was an option to think about what our culture and what our country could look like through that lens. Like it just had never even, and I'm finding it such a both overwhelming topic and a very hope inspiring topic. Um, it's overwhelming because it touches on so many issues that I've, that I am passionate about. Um, it, it touches on climate justice, it touches on racial justice, it touches, it touches on classism and wealth distribution, it touches on health care and mental health care, it touches on education, and it, it more than touches on, it, it, all of those systems are crucial and vital to a place where prison policing can be abolished. Like the, like all of those systems are, are so underfunded and so anemic. And at the cost of those systems, we've built up other punitive systems and, and, and to what outcome? You know what I mean? Like, they're not, they're not working. Like, period. I mean, you know, they talk in the interview about, like, in fact, specifically Austin Channing Brown talks about, you know, that's the other thing that's really interesting about these podcasts and about these shows is, is, is watching women demonstrate or model their learning process to model their honesty and their willingness to get it right, but not be right. That is so inspiring. Um, and I think it's one of the, the most limiting things about kind of our, our current over culture, our current white over culture is this, this need to be right all the time at the expense of learning at the expense of compassion at the expense of, of really of everything is this need to be right. Um, and it's so destructive. And so watching people model not being right or like finding paths to learning is so inspiring. And, and, oh, so, and specifically, you know, Austin Channing Brown talks about, she's like, you know, I thought I was an abolitionist. And she said, but then I was re reading um, Maya Shinwar's book. And she said, I realized that I wasn't because I still had this, um, this like, well, I mean, I believe that except for, you know, these cases or except for these folks or, you know, when it comes down to brass tacks, like I don't want that person to live next to me. And, and usually these, and she later went on to explain, and then um, Maya Shinwar also, basically these are often what we think about, I think especially as women, is um, sexual violence. And so 
she models like this coming to realization of like that she has this like block about this and like trying to break it down in terms of like well how am I I'm letting this block me from what this system as a larger whole could look like and I think that's so easy to do like right like I totally empathize with that um you know and I empathize with a lot of folks that you know probably in the last podcast when I talked about police abolition just were immediately like shh shh like I completely empathize because you know there's fear there there's lots of fear and somebody made a comment of, in the podcast notes or in the you know the YouTube comments last time like which was essentially something equivalent to, yeah, but have you ever had violence done against you? And like, maybe you would feel differently if you had, and I have. Um, the reality being that I understand that, that I'm a mother. Like I fear for my child, like she's, you know, she's not allowed to do a lot of stuff that she would like to do probably because I do have fear in my mind for her well-being and her safety. And so I don't, I, I don't come to this thought process without that, without, I don't feel like I am exceedingly naive. I feel like I am naive in many ways, but I don't feel like I am exceedingly naive or exceedingly head in the clouds about it. I feel like I feel like justice is is often a very it's a complicated beast, right? Like it's I don't you know, and, and I don't think anybody is saying that it's not. Nobody is saying like, "Oh, throw open the doors and like let's just let anarchy reign." Like there people, you know, they specifically said in the in the um in the interview that, there, you know, our, one of our blocks to this idea is the concept that there won't be ways to deal with harm and violence. A and there will be. There will be ways to deal with harm and violence. But, like, let's think about the ways that we're dealing with harm and violence now and whether or not they are working. Does this work? Does it... Especially when you're talking about sexual violence... Do people who are incarcerated for sexual violence, are they any less likely to be sexually violent? But in fact, are they in a system that is sexually violent towards them that then further perpetrates these situations of power and control through what is often sexual violence? And anyway, such, oh my goodness, such an expansive topic because again, it really does tendril into just all of these social justice issues that are so complicated and have felt um have just felt like they are the way like the only way but we forget that they are like we forget that you know prisons are only a couple hundred years old and that policing is not born of like our you know genetic history like this is a man-made structure and even just as a thought process, right? Like, even just as a thought exercise, why are we so resistant to even thinking about how that could look different? Anyway, it's just really blowing my mind. And so it's, it's both um, a lot of really heavy stuff to be thinking about, um, but ultimately feels hopeful. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's nobody is like, oh, yes, we do X, Y, Z. And that is clearly the path forward. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> that would be really nice. I could get behind that. Um, but at the same time, like, there is this great hope that I see these people in the and they're developing these ideas and exploring these thoughts. And and I'm so thankful that I have access to their 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 thought product um and it is it's really exciting exciting is maybe not the right word it isn't the right word but it does feel hopeful even though it might feel like heavy and like ugh, there's a lot of weight but there is hope 
you know, it doesn't feel like it's so heavy that you just are going to lie down. It, it feels like, okay, this is going to be grueling and this is going to be inches at a time. And, but it, you know, it does feel like there's something there, um, which whew, sometimes it doesn't feel like that, you know, lots of times it doesn't feel like that. So I'm really, I'm thankful for this really been, it's been overwhelming, but it's also been hopeful and I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. Oh, another thing that they talked about that has really been is harm versus criminalization. Like, you know, if we're working with this punitive, this punishment model, right, that we're going to punish folks for doing wrong, like how do we decide what is wrong? And like so many things are so harmful to, like so many companies, for example, so many, um, money-making institutions do so much harm. They do so much harm to the environment. They do so much harm by plundering resources. They do so much harm, excuse me, by um, plundering workers um, and, their pro and their product. Um, but those institutions are punished, but they're doing great harm versus you know, the woman who falsified her address so that she could get her child into a better, excuse me, school district, who then is sentenced to like five years or something. You know, so anyways, this is like concept of like harm versus criminalization and like where, where do we sit on that? And like, what, you know, we are in a different place than we were when these legislative things were enacted and like who controls that now like probably that company that's doing a lot of harm to a lot of folks um but but is free of that punitive process anyway it's a bunch of stuff that I don't know anything about but I hope that you are interested in learning about it too because boy And it's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Shenanigans of the gullet. Now that I say the word gullet, it's not making sense anymore. So I hope it's like gastronomical shenanigans. So last summer, Joanna at Spin Farm offered very graciously to allow my daughter and I to come pick sour cherries from her sour cherry tree. And we were total babies and did not pick nearly as many as I wanted to. Okay, we were not total babies, but my child was a total baby. <laughs> and I did not feel comfortable getting on the ladder. So together we were babies and did not pick nearly as many cherries as I would have ideally liked us to. Also, we maybe shouldn't be gluttons. <sighs> But anyway, so we picked all these cherries and we've, I just like quick froze them. I didn't syrup them. I didn't do any, I didn't even pit them. I just rinsed them off really good. Got a good like thin coating of water on them, I thought, and then put them in, in freezer bags and froze them. And then felt like I needed to make a pie out of them because that's what you do with tart cherries, right? But then like kept being intimidated by making pie because I am not a pie maker, but I come from pie makers. So there's like a lot of like stuff around pie in my head. I know it's weird. Um, but so I kept being like, oh, I should use those cherries. And like, I, I should make a pie. But then being like, not making that pie ever. <laughs> So for some reason, oh, that's right, because now it's time for sour cherries again, almost. I was like, dude, go down there and get those cherries out of the freezer and make something with them. So I decided to make a sour cherry slump. It was amazing. Now, let me just discuss. Like, I don't think particularly that the slump was amazing. If you don't know what a slump is, it's kind of like a cobbler. 
it's like a cup. It's like a biscuity sort of like steamed thing, but you can make it on the stove. So it's really good to make in the summer because you don't have to heat up your oven. You can make it like just in like a deep, you can make it like in your, um, just like your pasta pot or whatever, depending on how much you're making. And basically what it is, is like you're making, um, like a slightly thickened filling with sugar, with whatever sugar you want. Um, so that's like a beautiful thing, right? Like you can super control that because you're not putting it in a pie and baking it, which is one of this, because I love fruit pie. That's my thing is I love fruit pie, but boy, it's so inconsistent y'all. I'm sure I could master a cream pie of some sort, but fruit pie, fruit pie, there's too many variables. But I do love the idea of the of the fillings that you cook before you bake them into the pie crust because then you have more control. Um, but, 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 but uh. so you make like essentially like a sort of pie filling, but then you put you drop like a slightly sweetened biscuit dough into it, and then you just steam it on top of the stove. So it doesn't get browned the dough but it does still offer kind of like a starchy bready component to the pie filling. Um, but the, sh the winner of this concoction was a, that nobody in my family would eat it except me. <laughs> so good. But those cherries, they did not taste like they could be a real thing that just like grew on a tree. And also that just grew in Indiana. Like if they grew on a tree, okay, maybe, but like only in the mountains of Chile or the high alpine regions of um, the rainforest. I don't know. They did not seem like they could be down the road. They're amazing. They were so good. I could have eaten, I think the filling had like two and a half pounds of cherry. I could have eaten all of it in one sitting. It was so amazingly delicious. And it was like it had been engineered. It wasn't like an ice cream where you're like, oh, I could eat this much of this ice cream or this much of this ice cream. But really I'm only enjoying this like front six bites of this ice cream. And after that, it kind of just like becomes it's not like, you know what I mean? Like there's diminishing returns on the remainder of the ice cream. No, there were no diminishing returns. In fact, if anything, there were whatever the opposite of diminishing is. <laughs> Upminishing returns. That is that the title of the podcast? I don't know. But anyway, like it was just each bite I kept getting more fascinated that it was so delicious. And that this was like, this is like some uh, tree made. Tree made this. What? A tree just made this? I don't know, man. I gotta buy this ramshackle house next to me. <coughs> Knock it down. Make a small shed for the raccoons to live in. And then put some cherry and apple trees over there because... <laughs> too much for this world. All right, I'm going to pause this because apparently I'm talking forever and I need to um, recharge my battery. So I'll be right back. I'm just going to go get the cord. I'm not recharging it. I'm just going to get the cord, but I'll be right back. Okay, so let's talk about wool. So I finished a big spinning project. I finished my um, factory blended. What do we call that? Anyway, I finished my fiber from Inglenook Fibers. Um, this is their geology series, and this is the mica colorway. It has merino, manx, tweed, and silk in it. And I spun almost a pound and a half, and I ended up with something like a thousand yards. So it is what it is. <laughs> I think that's like worsted Yeah, we're going to go with worsted And here it is. So this was super pleasurable to spin. I 
highly recommend their blended fibers, their mill blended fibers. Maybe that's what it's called. This is a little bit of a weird colorway. <laughs> Um, but I think I still like it. It's, I really dig the pink and purple part of it, which is kind of not what I thought I would enjoy. Um, I really enjoyed spinning it because it still had the variability that's so enjoyable about blend, a spinning dyed top, but I knew that I was going to have a more cohesive, um, you know, fiber at the, a yarn at the end, a more versatile yarn for me, uh, just because I don't as often knit with, um, the super like multicolored yarns. I do think it's, it's easier for me to knit with more semi-solids. So this was a great way to still have that variability of the fiber to keep the spinning interesting, but to create maybe something that's not semi-solid, but is somewhere between variegated and semi-solid, if that makes sense. Oh my gosh, by the way, do you love my Katie Green Bean stamp? So these are just like oak tags that I accidentally bought a gajillion of. I think I thought I was buying like a thousand, maybe not even that. I think I thought I was buying like 200 and I bought like 2000. <laughs> But anyway, I've used these forever for spinning, but I just wanted something fancier on them. So I, I, that was an excuse to buy this stamp from Katie Greenbean. She has several very cute stamps. Um, but anyway, so I'm very pleased with it. I, okay, I'm pleased with it. I can't decide if I'm very pleased with it, but I do like the yarn. I like how the yarn feels. It's a little crazy though. I'll figure out something to do with it that I'll really like. It was a very enjoyable spin. Um, and I highly recommend Eagle Nook Fibers in general. I've spun their bats before and now their mill, their mill blended top and then, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I don't think I've spun their just dyed top, but I would recommend it without reservation because they do such a lovely job. So I have a giant yarn baby. And it smells very good. Okay. So then, knit, uh, knitting, I actually did knit something. So, um, Bill of Saw Wet Farms, Knit Spin Farms, um, cranked a sock tube for me out of this beautiful yarn that I was gifted. That's the Modem, which is the 100% not super wash, 100% wool, Portuguese wool. And I've been excited to try it. So, um, I've been wanting to try some non super wash, non nylon yarns, um, to see if they will make my feet less sweaty. So we'll see. So I got this tube cranked up and he cranked the full hundred grams for me, which for me as a 72 stitch sock circumference person, um, and a size us 11 shoe will make me two pairs of kind of shorter socks. And then I just used some West Yorkshire Spinner Signature 4-ply um, that you can get at the Woolly Thistle. You can get the Simply Sock Yarn. Um, it's 75.25 wool nylon. I can't find the color. Whatever. Anyway. So I just used that for um, heels and toes. And I thought, well, that might be good too in terms of um, durability. Cause you know, if you're worried about the, the having nylon versus not having nylon. Oh, actually one of the, these, oh no, that's true, both of these. Actually both of these I used um, Quince, whatever, is it Finch? the fingering weight one? I think so. And the Carrie's yellow. I used that for the toes, but then I was running out. So I went to the West Yorkshire for the heels. And I decided to try to do like a one by one rib um, to see if that would help with a shorter sock to keep it on. So I did one of them with a little bit of ribbing and then one without to see if it makes a difference on how it wears on my, or how it stays on my foot as a shorter sock. So we'll see. But I'm very excited. I, love, I really do like the look of this yarn. 
and the little bit that I did knit with was very enjoyable. And it feels somewhat similar to like a West Yorkshire spinner. Um, not, it feels less, more like that than the opal, I think. But so anyway, so now I have a new pair of socks and then I've started on the others. And I'm excited. I did do um, like a little heel tab on, on one of these. Um, but I had, I wasn't sure about the fit and I had actually started it up too high. So I ripped that back and just did ripping. Um, but that was kind of fun to do like the little heel tab. You just do it with short rows and you just work back and forth essentially right here. And then you hem the sock versus having a ribbing. And that was, I don't know, I'm, I think I'm definitely going to do that in the future um, and try it out again, just on a sock that's a little bit shorter as it was a little bit too low. Um, but so that's what I've been doing knitting. Oh, I'll show you this one too. Like, look. Look how fun the opal tube is. It's so giant. I think I can get even more socks out of this. Whatever. Cross that bridge. So I don't believe that they're cranking socks down because they're doing their summer stuff. Uh, but I think in this fall, this fall you'll, you'll probably see some cranking open up for them. Okay. Now crochet. The rest of the episode is crochet. Okay, that's not true. I have two crochet projects and then some sewing. So, um, my Grady Stripe cardigan that I'm, whoa, that I'm working on. <laughs> okay, so I'm actually probably not any further than last time. I, I'm, I'm like a row further because I actually had to rip back a whole bunch because um, because my size is not in the pattern and I'm just kind of winging it. I had made the back, I should know better, but I don't, I haven't done a lot of drop shoulder sweaters, which is silly because it's like the easiest one, but whatever. I did too much shaping. No, that's not true. I am bigger in the front than I am in the back. Um, so usually I put more stitches on the front of my sweater and fewer stitches on the back of my sweater. And then I kind of like even them out through the shaping of the armhole and the neckline and stuff like that. But of course, if you are doing a drop shoulder sweater, there's fewer places to make that adjustment. Plus the crochet is a little bit more complicated to lose stitches in. You can get yeah, a can and I have, but um, anyway, I'm less experienced. Let's say that I'm just less experienced with it. So what had happened is if I was knitting a regular sweater for me and I was doing like a modified or, you know, like a, a more inset sleeve, I would have just a little bit of stitches on the back because I'm, you know, there's less fabric needed there. And then more on the front. And then I would just like lose stitches in the front. But with it being a drop shoulder, they actually do need to be even, like in terms of like where it's hitting on your body. So anyway, I had like made the back not a drop shoulder, but the front a drop shoulder. And then I realized like two thirds of the way through the arm that that was not the way you can do that. <laughs> That's a lot of words for me to say that, but that's basically what it is. So, the, and I also realized I had gone up too far in the front for the neck shaping. So the front wasn't too bad. I just ripped it down, I don't know, like eight rows, 10 rows, something like that. But the back I had to rip all the way down to the armhole. And then I had made, I had luckily, I had quite a few stitches I had cast off, or not cast off because it's crochet, but like had left without anything on them. Um, so I was able to kind of like just widen the back slightly more so that they will be even. So many times during this podcast when I'm talking to you, I'm like, why are you even saying all these things? But then like, that's what you say in a podcast, right? Because if I didn't say all these things, then we wouldn't be saying anything. And it just feels weird sometimes. So thank you for sitting with the weirdness with me. So it probably doesn't look any different than it did last time, but it's much wider in the back. <laughs> so I am getting pretty close to a shoulder seam, y'all. I'm getting pretty close. 
and I am excited about it. Look at this cute homie. Oh my gosh, with my Milk Maid braids, and then you're gonna see my pajama pants. I say pajama, they're house pants. You're gonna see my house pants made out of bed sheets in a minute. I am living my best life. Right? That's all there's to it. Anyway, but I'm very pleased with it, and it's very pleasant to work on. I've had, I will also say this. It's Friday. I think the last time I recorded was on a Thursday. So we're actually just like two weeks out from that. But I should have recorded earlier in the week. But I have had trouble getting stuff done these two weeks. Um, just, you know, I think you I think you can empathize. Um, but I am still excited about this project. And I am excited about doing some more knitting. I realize I've been only crocheting pretty much. <laughs> And I don't know, I just guess I needed a little moment. I should probably do some Stephen West knitting. That'll help me get back into the groove. So then the next thing I'm gonna show you is my sort of crochet version of the foolproof. So I talked about it last week. This is a cro for my it's my crochet version of Louise Zass Bangham's I'm probably saying her name wrong. Uh, foolproof. And what I'm doing is kind of using the Church Mouse Yarn and Tees half square granny triangle shawl. I don't know, whatever. It's in the show notes. Bear with me. I'm using that combined with the ever so lovely Just Feel Festive shawl by Kalisha Ryan, who, by the way, has a podcast. I did not realize I'm such a fool. She has um, a YouTube channel, but look how pretty that is. Right? So I'm combining the two. That's a, that is a free pattern, by the way. And so here is one half so far. Suzanne, I figured it'd be kind of like a 72 inch. So I'm just doing two 36 ish inch sections. And this is a patchwork quit. It's a patchwork kit that is yarn I spun from Hello Yarns Fiber. And then here's the second piece that I'm working on. Right? Are you in love with it? Totally. I mean, come on. That is gorgeous. So into it. It's going to look like this. It's going to look like this when it's all done. I also feel like I could make a million of these and not get tired of them. I, you're here, right? Like you can see the light coming in and it looks so good on the stitches with my quilted table topper. Oh my gosh. Like living the fanciest Instagram life ever. So that's all the wool craft. The rest is going to be sewing. So if you're not interested in sewing, I'll talk to you next time. But if you are, I need to stop slurping my iced coffee. Goodness gracious. Okay, so I did make one thing that I can't show you. I made Tova, my daughter, um, I made her a very basic dress with like the elastic uh, thread at the top. So like the elastic thread smocking and just looks so, super cute on her. So, but she's at her mammals right now. So I'll probably show you next time. But did I, when I plugged in the camera, is it like, is it like slowly turning? Whatever. Probably is. Um, see what's happening. Am I turning? Am I moving? I don't know. I talked last time. <laughs> that I was going to, I was interested in making the Willandra pants, which is a pattern by Muna and Broad. So it looks like this, maybe. 
<laughs> or not. Oh, come on. Oh, the line drawing is just not showing up. And it's really descriptive. Um, maybe if I turn it away from the, the light. <laughs> That's helpful, right? You can totally tell what's happening there. Whatever. Their pants. Here they are finished on my body. Okay, so this might be the most unusual angle that you've seen in the podcast, but here we go. I want to show you my pants. Um, these are my Willandra pants, which is a pattern by Muna and Broad. And they, now I did cut six inches off of mine. So the, the first pair I did, I used them full length and they would have been a fine length for me as regular pants. Um, and you can kind of, I think you'll be able to see. Do you see how the, um, the inseam is not perpendicular to the floor, but is at an angle? And so that angle continues down and is more exaggerated, I think, in the fuller length pant. Um, but I just wanted to give you an idea. Now, I have the B belly, so I have the two layer belly. Um, the, so in profile, it looks like a B. Um, so I always have the option of wearing my pants in two different positions. So hey, that's a good thing, right? So here is the waist, like at what I would consider my natural waist. Bam, bam, bam. And then here it is up, like at above my natural waist. This is actually typically how I wear them. Um, just because usually pants in the rise fit me better um, if I wear them higher. But I just wanted to show you that there are two different options. Now, the difference of these and the pattern as written is that um, the pattern as written has a flat front here. So it's not this, the, the waistband is still elastic from like here around, but it's flat here. Um, and on these, since they're pajama pants, I just made it a full elastic waistband. It wasn't like any less or more work necessarily. I was just kind of curious to see what the difference is. Um, so it doesn't really make that much difference just with my body specifically, but I don't know, you know, if it would make difference to somebody else. Um, but so yeah, here they are. I'm pretty excited. Okay, I'm like super excited about them, y'all. They are definitely not flattering, meaning they don't look my extremely fat body, look slightly less extremely fat, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm aware, I guess, um, but I still really dig them and they're super comfy and it's a way for me to break away from my dependence on the black cropped yoga pant that is becoming increasingly disposable. That's my whole issue. I actually really love the black cropped, well, okay. There's two reasons. That pant has no pockets, which is super duper annoying. Um, and these are pockets. Oh my gosh, I didn't even tell you the pockets, right? So two giant pockets. Like, I think you might be able to put like an iPad in there. It's, they're actually almost too big because I put my phone in, I have to like go spelunking to get it. What? And like, let me just discuss, look how cute. This is another thing, the pants, because of the way the, um, the side seam works with it having, being on an angle and not perpendicular, it means that the side seam is actually slightly to the front of your body. And so the, the pockets don't hit on the very widest part of your body. They hit a little bit forward. So even if there is a little bit more bulk, it's just like slightly less noticeable because Here's the widest part of my body, and then the pocket is, you know, like two and a half, three inches in. So that's pretty exciting. And I did, and I did not do a pair with the. Um, I made a pair of like out of ripstop, and I made the pocket like a cotton because I was just concerned that like three layers of the ripstop would be too much. Um, and they worked out really well too. So super exciting. And basically, I need all the old bed sheets to make all of my pajama pants with. Okay? Okay. So, I hope that you can kind of tell what's going on. <laughs> anyway, I'm super excited about them. 
So what happened is we went to Ikea a while back and got, um, they had, they have fabric at Ikea uh, and it's super duper cheap. Well, they had this blue and in the store it felt silkier, but it's very much the texture of like a Kona cotton or any kind of quilter's cotton. Maybe it's slightly less tight woven than a quilter's cotton, but whatever. It's a very similar fabric. Except it costs $2.99 a yard. It was not on sale. That is the price of it. And it's like 58 inches wide. That's cheaper than muslin. And it's actually a wearable muslin. So I made these pans. They cost $6.00 very exciting because I was not sure I mean uh, pants are my clothing nemesis like you saw I have a big butt I have big legs um I have big calves like what who tries on pants and is like these calves are too bit tall small in these pants whatever I have I am a fat bottomed girl like I I'm fat everywhere but especially in the bottom half so pants are like my nemesis and specifically woven pants. Oh my gosh, I can wear a stretchy pant all day long. But woven pants, not easy. But I've been really, oh, as I said in that clip, I think I, I feel trapped by the disposable pants that I have been roped into using. Um, because I just have not found an alternative and I don't like it because they like after two seasons, they start to be so pilly that I don't want to wear them anymore. And even around the house, they freak me out because they catch all the threads and they make, they mess up my visual train of thought and it's not good for me. My visions. But I'm so excited about my woven pants. I'm really happy. So I, I did these and I did them exactly as the pattern would say. And I used exactly the size that I would use um, because I was between sizes. And so since I am big in the leg, I went up um, and I used my hip size. I don't remember if they tell me that, but I mean, that's what I should just use for drying up pants, uh, pants patterns. Uh, they were very easy. They have a front piece, a back piece, a pocket and a waistband. Is that right? So there are only four pieces to cut out, which means only four pieces to potentially have to modify. Uh, and I really like them. Now, if now I'm just trying to kind of give you an idea of like how regular pants fit me. And by regular, I mean Lane Bryant, because like that's kind of the alter, that's what there is. They're always way too long in the rise on me, Lane Bryant's pants. They're usually way too big in the waist to fit my butt or legs or both. And then they're way too long in the front. Now, part of that is because I think they're actually made to sit higher on my waist. Like they're not made to sit at my natural waist, but like above that. Um, but when you have like a regular waistband that doesn't stay there on me, but when it's elastic, it will stay there. So anyway, what was I going with that? I don't know, just to give you an idea that usually pants are too long of the rise on me. Now maybe it's because it's like a thinner material, it's not like a gent denim. So like it, even if it is longer in the rise, it doesn't bunch up in the same way that jeans do. I don't know, uh, but whatever, I like it. I'm totally into it, I'm excited. So I have my Ikea fabric pants, I have my vintage sheet pants. And by the way, somebody asked like why I would look on eBay versus going to Goodwill. And maybe I asked, talked about this last time and I'm sorry if I did. I hate going to Goodwill. I go for my daughter because she enjoys going to Goodwill, but I actually hate going to Goodwill or like thrift stores in general. I don't know, it's a dumb thing. It's not like a dirty thing. It's not like a germy thing. It's not, it's like a visual thing. Like I get really freaked out when things are like kind of, you would never think that by looking at anything I own, <laughs> which is all higgledy piggledy all the time. 
but for some reason, I think it's just like an amount of visual information situation. Like this stuff I know the look of and so it doesn't assault me visually when it's there's lots of it because I like get to know each piece individually versus going into like a retail situation where it's all new stuff that I have to process in my brain. And so, yeah, there's lots of stories like really freak me out a little bit more than I can handle. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> That's, I don't know where that was going. But anyway, so then I also made these. So now I have the same pants, three different ones in true fat lady style. I will certainly have more house pants soon because I'm really excited about them. Um, but this is just like a, a cotton ripstop. And I was really pleased with how it turned out. Now I'll show you a little bit. <clears throat> oh, I talked about the pockets. So on these, I did a contrasting pocket. Turn them inside out so you can see. Oh, and I'll show you too, like the flat waistband. So I told you about that, but then I couldn't show you. So like the front of the waistband is flat. These are, by the way, these are a wearable muslin. They're a little wonky, but whatever. Um, and that's what I meant when I said the front of the waistband is flat and then it's elastic over here. Excuse me. Um, oh, so yeah, so I made contrasting pockets. So I have cute secret pockets. In my pants. Which makes me really happy. Um, and so finishing inside, I just used my serger to go over the edges. Oh, and so things I learned that I did not know. Um, not specifically from this, but from something else. I don't remember, but I'll tell you in case you didn't know. I always thought that you should use a smaller stitch if you wanted your garment to be more durable. So like in the crotch of your pants um, or in the side seams or whatever, I always just thought like, oh, I should use a smaller stitch and that will be more durable. But in reality, what you should do is use a longer stitch because what you want to actually have happen is that you want the thread to break before the fabric tears. Which makes perfect sense because you want to be able to repair the thing and not just have to like patch it very visibly or you, I mean in the rise it's a little bit. Um, so that was interesting. Right? And I was really worried. I was really worried about the durability of the woven pant because it has no give and like Again, I have all of this butt to what do I do with it? And so I was really concerned that because like, I think what I was thinking of is like the garments of my childhood that were sewn for me. Um, and like they were not lots of times they were pinking sheer cut out, but they didn't have like overcast edges or anything. And I think what happened is they just got unraveled near the seam and therefore it weakened the, fi the fabric there. Um, but so, so that was another block in my head about sewing pants for myself is like, oh, it's, unless they're stretched, they're just not gonna, they're totally working fine. So I sewed my wearable muslins, my, um, my blue Ikea pants, and then I immediately cut the bottoms off of them and wore them outside to dig a hole. <laughs> Cause I thought it would be a good experiment to see like how they did fine. And I had not even overcast them at that point because again, they were just a muslin. So I had just sewn them. Um, the pattern does have you do two seams um, in the cross, the crotch seam. Do you like this? This is what that is. Except it's more like this. They do have you double that seam. Um, but I hadn't even like overcast the edges or anything like that. You could do a French if you wanted to, like you do whatever. Cause they give you a half inch seam allowance in these, in this pattern. I sewed the size five and it goes up to a seven or an eight, I think. I'm like a 28, maybe 30 in my pants. Um, and in sewing patterns, I'm like an 84 cause they're always smaller. But anyway, they fit just right out of the gate. I didn't do anything too. I was so exciting. Um, oh, so I did my I did my gardening and I bent down and squatted down and did stuff. And so then I felt pretty confident that they were gonna do okay for me. And then I came and cut out um, my ripstop and my sheet at the same time. So I got I cut two pairs of pants out at once. And I have 
probably worn these pajama, these uh, house pants six times since I made them. They're doing great. Basically, I've just put them on every day since I made them. I had to leave the house once. That's the only time I have not been wearing them. Let me just also discuss, I don't have a uterus anymore. I can totally make bed sheet pants. Not worry about it. How exciting is that? Uteruses are great, but not having one is awesome. Just saying. It's pretty exciting. So yeah, I'm pretty excited about my pants and um, I'm definitely gonna be do doing more. Um, I'm definitely going to make, I used a queen flat sheet for these and I have quite a bit left over. So I forgot to say this, that my silver koi fish moment of the past few weeks was that as I was ironing the waistband of my um, house pants, they're made out of an old sheet, it smelled exactly like my grandma ironing something and I don't remember my grandmother ironing sheets she may have I don't remember her ironing sheets or maybe it's this you know that's probably what it is it's probably the smell of the sheets in the dryer because it reminded it was like I was in her laundry room and I think it's that like these old sheets are 50 50 cotton polyester um and that's like made them permanent so you didn't have to press them. But I think that that is what the very specific smell of ironing them is. Because I washed this sheet, um, you know, in my own like scent free washing liquid, whatever, machine wash. And I dried it because I wasn't sure how it had been laundered and I want to make sure that it was, you know, shrunk and everything. Um, and I didn't notice it in either, you know, either of those pure, it was not until I actually pressed it with steam. It was amazing. It was an am I mean, it just, and so that's the only thing I can think of because it's not been in anybody's house that I know that we would have like a family smell. Um, it, it, you know, it wasn't using the same laundry detergent she used, you know, it was, the, I think it's the specific smell of this like 50, 50 cotton poly blend that sheets were made out of like in the 70s, 60s, 80s, something like that. Anyway, just thought I would put that in there. It was pretty cool. Um, so I think I can actually make like a cami out of the rest. I don't know if I want to be that matchy matchy. But maybe I'll get like a coordinating bed sheet and then I can like mix and match my house outfits. such a mess. <laughs> I was also supposed to talk about what I had canned, but I'll just make a note of that for next time. I made some um, ginger strawberry jam, which I'm not excited about, sadly. And we did some maraschino. Okay, I made some maraschino cherries, even though I don't think I've ever eaten a maraschino cherry. I don't think I have. But my daughter loves them, like, loves them. So we're going to try these homemade ones, but even if she doesn't like them, we'll just like make some Martha Washington candies. Did your family make those when you were younger? My aunt Faye, my great aunt Faye always made Martha Washington candies, which is like some sort of like, you know, like the middle of a drop, can like the goop, like the goop, it's like a can I don't even know what it's called. It's like sweet, creamy stuff. And then it has nuts and chopped up maraschino cherries. And I don't think there's anything, coconut maybe, probably. That makes sense. And then you ball that up and dip it in chocolate. That sounds delicious. Oh my gosh. <laughs> when I was a kid, I would not eat the ones with maraschino cherries in them because I would not eat that. Um, but she sometimes made some without those, which was very exciting to me. So anyway, so that was all to say. 
cherries were on sale. <laughs> Sweet cherries were on sale. And so, I mean, so I'll let you know how those are next time. Well, she'll let you know. I don't think I want to eat one. I don't know, it's just weird. Right? Mm, whatever. They're very pretty. They're much prettier than the, than the store ones. Because they're like dark cherry color. Instead of like that violent Coca-Cola red. <sighs> anyway. I'll tell you about it next time. <laughs> I'm going to put the note right here. Oh my goodness. I hope you have a week. I hope it's bearable. I hope there are koi fish. I hope there are new ideas that give you hope. I hope your hair does what you wanted to do one day of the week. I hope you don't care the other days. I'll talk to you next time.